be short and sweet. When I told the why is there a picture of a piece of toast on the front of this, it's because when I told my dad that I was preparing a lecture on biostats, he said, oh, that sounds about as fun as yesterday's toast. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully I can do better than yesterday's toast. That's my primary goal. Um, but I, I guess I wanted to uh, present to you a couple of ideas in a different way than you may have been taught, and I'm a visual learner, so I wanted to talk about um, hypothesis testing and the type 1, type 2 errors, talk a little bit about what p-value means, um, but to do it uh, in a visual way. So hypothesis testing means something kind of specific in, in clinical research and statistics. It's not simply, it's not about trying to prove that an idea you have is right. It actually, it, it has an order of operations and it's, it's very counterintuitive. It's focused on um, disproving uh, the null hypothesis, which is very, um, like I said, counterintuitive. So hypothesis testing is about um, taking a sample and using a sample to make inferences about the general population. So as much as I would love to study every heart failure patient in the United States, um, I have to accept the fact that I'm stuck with a sample. Um, and just so you know, when we talk about population uh, characteristics, we, we might use the word parameter. And rather than statistics, uh, we use these Greek terms. So you may hear me say mu. And when I say mu, it just means what the mean is of the population. It's a hypothetical number that I will never know. Um, it's something that we try to estimate. Um, but when I'm talking about a sample, I'm using regular letters, and I'm, I might use the word M, um, use the letter M. So this is all about what, what statistics is about, is trying to make uh, estimations and inferences based on samples uh, to figure out what would happen uh, if you subjected the population to a certain treatment or a diagnostic test. So like I said, hypothesis testing has a specific meaning. And, and really it's about trying to tell whether or not a distribution of uh, two different distributions are di different because of just chance and sampling error, or if there's actually something that's fundamentally different about the two groups of people. Uh, you can think about um, the two groups as one that has is subjected to a treatment and one that's not. So how do we, how do we start uh, this? How do we start uh, with hypothesis testing? We always start with uh, the null hypothesis. And I thought that was as easy as just saying, well, the treatment doesn't work. But it really means actually trying to come up with an estimate of what you think uh, a certain parameter in the population <coughs> is. So I might guess that on a, um, on a Friday night, the <coughs> average blood alcohol level of the population of some certain college campus is 320. Um, I don't, I, I will never know what that number is, but I'm forced at this stage in the process to come up with some kind of a value that I think belongs to the population. Again, I don't know what that is, but um, I can, I can start to try to get there through some uh, more counterintuitive <coughs> thinking. So if you think of, let's see, this right here is a sample from that larger population. Um, you, ha you have to sort of hypothesize or imagine that you can take hundreds of thousands of different samples from one population, <laughs> and each one of them is a little bit different. Each one of them, let's say you ha were to grab a group of 25 people from a population, each one of them is going to have a slightly different mean. And if you were to keep sampling these over and over and over, which we're never going to do, no one's going to be able to do this, but hypothetically, you would imagine that most of the means would start to, if you were to do this over and over and over and over again, most of them would pile up somewhere pretty close to where the true population mean uh, exists. Does that make sense? Does this graph make sense to you? It, does, it didn't make sense to me initially, but basically, the, the whole thing about <coughs> hypothesis testing and, and coming up with alpha and type 1 values is based on this curve. So you just have to imagine that you're pulling 
five marbles out of them, sort of an infinite bag of them, and that if you were to calculate a mean value every single time you did this, it, there, there's some things that we can say. We can say that you're going to get a normal distribution of different means, and that they're going to pile up around what the true mean value is of the population. So this is called sample distribution. So when we talk about, um, so here's your sample distribution again, and this is the population mean if the null hypothesis is true. Again, all of this is based on the null hypothesis. So what I can say is that here, these values of the mean are going to be pretty high probability. If the null hypothesis is true and I get a value around here, there's a good chance that it belongs to this population. But if I start to get a mean value that's out here at the extremes, it's less likely to come from this null hypothesis population. So these are actually called the critical regions. And they're just the tail ends of this distribution um, where, the, uh, where the values would be less likely. So who determines where these tails are? The researcher does. So the researcher is the one who determines that before they even do the experiment, um, they're going to decide to reject the null hypothesis if the values are this extreme. So uh, the typical, like conventional uh, value is 0.05 or 5%. And basically that says, and that's split into two tails. So if a value is this far from the mean, it's going to be, um, if it's beyond this 2.5% region, it's, we're going to reject the null hypothesis. That's something that we set out to do even before beginning, um, beginning the experiment. So um, that's something that we determine. And that's, that's sort of arbitrary, that's random. You're going to have different, um, sorry, this is a, this is PowerPoint, not Keynote. But basically, you're going to perform a test statistic, which I'm not going to go into any math here, but these statistics are basically looking at uh, systematic differences between two populations, and it's a ratio of that over some kind of expected error you have from sampling. So type one error is the, is the possibility, is the probability of rejecting a null hypothesis when really you, you shouldn't have. So um, that's if you were to get a value right here in the critical region, but that result, that mean, really belongs to the null hypothesis the null population and not this alternative distribution. So, I, I don't know, I'm just going to ask, does anyone want to volunteer what they, their definition of a p-value is? If I say a p-value is less than 0 0.05, what does that mean to you? And the thing about p-values is it's maybe not the best way of describing data, but it's so pervasive in our literature that I think we should have some idea of exactly what does that mean. Probably the the result the probability that the result that you obtain is less is less than five percent. Right. So um, that's pretty good. That's so that a p value less than 0 0.05. The, every statement about what p value means should start with the phrase if the null hypothesis is true. A p value of let's say 0 0.04 means the probability of obtaining a result that is this far out in the extreme, or, or even more extreme than that, is, is 4%, if the null hypothesis is true. But every definition of a p-value should begin with the phrase, if the null hypothesis is true. So a p-value of, what it doesn't say is that, what the p-value of 0.04 doesn't mean, is it doesn't mean that the chances that the null hypothesis is true is 4%. It is a, it's a slight, variation in semantics. So I can't say that the chances of the null hypothesis is true equals x percent with the, this whole basis. <coughs> this is all based on the premise that the null hypothesis is true. So if a p-value, let's say a 0.67, it doesn't tell you that the chances that the null hypothesis per tr is true is 67%. What it tells you is that 
if you get a value of 0.67, it's not going to be far from the um, from the null mean. And that it's a, and if the null hypothesis is true, you're not surprised at all that you got a result that's pretty close to the mean. So a p value is all based on the supposition that the null hypothesis is true, and that's kind of weird. Um, that, that you're you, what you're really interested in is whether or not your alternative hypothesis is true. But the way this is all based is um, on whether or not you're going to reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis. Also, one thing you should know is that if you do get a p value that's a couple of things. One is that if you do get a p-value that's greater than 0.05, let's say you get a p-value of 0.1, does that mean that the null hypothesis is true and there is no effect? It means that you have failed to show a work that, uh, an effect. It doesn't mean that there is no effect. Um, so that's an important distinction to make. And this p-value of 0.05 is really what someone decided basically in the 1920s it was like an idea that you came up with at happy hour. Uh, and it was never supposed to be a really fixed value. It was supposed to have some flexibility in it. Um, so just know that a p-value 0.05 is arbitrary. It's a convention that we set. Um, and, and it really, it, it's meant to help guide um, uh, an inference that you want to draw about whether or not the null hypothesis can be um, rejected. But it's, uh, it's very arbitrary. This just shows that p-values can be, you can set them to be stricter than just 0.05. And maybe you want to set it to be stricter. If I am looking at um, a treatment that's very invasive, I want to have, I want to hold myself to a higher standard before saying that it's actually um, effective and, and hold myself to a stricter um, number before I reject the null hypothesis. So I may set out to, um, have an alpha of 0.01. And so you'll notice that smaller values might be selected for treatments that have big implications if they are going to be adopted. So the chances of a type 1 error decreases with each of these different thresholds. But just know that that comes at a trade off. If I'm going to set my alpha at 0.01 and and say that I'm going to find a, treat, a, a treatment effect way out here, I'm going to have less of a chance of finding that effect. So if there's a trade-off that comes with um, selecting stricter alpha levels. And just know that there are alpha levels. You can see that the, the 0.05 that I showed you before, it's split into two tails. That's saying, I don't know if the treatment's going to um, cause uh, an increase in blood pressure or a decrease in blood pressure. And that's, that's pretty much the convention and the standard. But you can have what you call a directional hypothesis, where you say, I know for sure that this is only going to lead to, let's say, an increase in the mean. And that 5% rather than being split into two tail ends is all on one end of your distribution. This is, you have to have a pretty compelling reason to do this. Um, for instance, if you, let's say, I did an experiment where I poured miracle Grow on something and I knew that it wasn't going to cause a shortening in, in length. Perhaps that would be some, uh, a reason to justify doing something like this, but it's, um, it's definitely not <coughs> accepted. So I know I talked about the null distribution. This is the alternative hypothesis distribution. I just wanted to talk a little bit about the power <coughs> sample. So what I'm looking at is a change in uh, the mean from the null hypothesis the null distribution, which could be considered almost as a control group, and the mean from the alternative distribution, which you consider the, the group that was treated. And you make a couple of assumptions when you're looking at this graph. You know that the shape of it doesn't change at all, meaning that the variability in the means isn't going to change. You're just going to add a fixed amount um, from one mean to the next. But remember this line where we drew the critical region of the null hypothesis right here. This is where we decided anything on this tail end we're going to reject. So if I have a group that has a treatment effect, and let's say a mean value lands right there, well, I'm going to actually accept the null hypothesis, and I'm at risk for failing to accept, um, failing to reject the null <coughs> hypothesis. So that is actually called a type 2 error. And the power 
should be rejecting the null hypothesis. So perhaps you've, um, I think I just explained that, right? Um, so perhaps you've heard someone say that a study was underpowered to find an effect. Um, and you'll hear about power calculations and sample size determination. So let's take like the crash trial where there were tens of thousands of patients that were evaluated for the for mortality benefit for tranexamic acid. They calculated that they would need at least 20,000 patients because they determined that a difference between means of an absolute reduction of 2% mortality was clinically significant enough. And so in order to find a small difference in mortality, they had to have um, a large sample size to, to have for the study to be adequately powered enough to be able to detect that difference. <coughs> so you have probably seen this before. Does this look familiar to you? I, I went back to my 2006 first day US at least preparation for the board's book and found this. Mm -hmm. I had highlighted some things and I don't know if I knew what they meant. But I, I wanted to give you a graphical, a different kind of representation of this so that this isn't something that you have to sort of commit to memory. Um, I, it's helpful just to think of a type one error and a type two error based on where an average of your population is gonna lie in the distribution of, of means um, if the treatment doesn't have an effect. So what is going to influence the power of a, of a study? Well, obviously effect size. If there's a huge effect that a treatment has, the distributions of these samples are going to be farther apart. And there's going to be less of a chance that you're going to find a mean where the two different uh, samples are overlapping. So I think that's kind of intuitive. And then another factor that's important for influencing statistical power is your sample size. So if I sample 100 patients rather than 25, there's going to be less variability between <coughs> the average value of 100 patients compared to the average value of 25 patients. So these distributions actually become narrower, and that also decreases the amount of overlap between them. And then the alpha level that I, I selected at the beginning obviously has a role on the statistical power because if I select a very strict alpha level all the way out here, then there's gonna be more overlap again between the two samples. So um, that's another important factor to, to keep in mind. So when you're looking at, I guess, hopefully this will give you a little bit more insight into p-values in, and when you're reading into a paper and then you're it's discussing power or you're reading some kind of pot uh, cast report and you're hearing that a study was underpowered to detect the difference. Perhaps that you could have these have like a visual in your mind of what they're talking about. There are studies out there that people claim were underpowered, like the it was called the, the Fellow study was about aptic oxygenation and whether or not that had a beneficial effect. And I read a lot of editorials about that paper and how that was underpowered to actually detect the kind of difference that they should, that the author should have stopped for. But questions do you have? I don't know that I, it's, maybe it's like today's toast, not yesterday's toast, today's <laughs> toast. Um, but it, what, what questions? Go ahead. What affects the power besides the, like, you know, the people you have? So besides the, well, the, what affects the power of the study? Yeah. So besides the, well, the effect size, um, the difference in means between the treated and the untreated group, and the, and what also affects it is the the, the alpha criteria that you set. So if I say that I, I'm not gonna reject the null hypothesis until I get in a value that's very extreme out there, less than 1% probability that the null hypothesis is true, then I'm decreasing the power of my study to be able to detect a true difference. So part of it is up to the researcher and where they're gonna arbitrarily decide to reject or accept the null hypothesis. So if you just like looked at your numbers and played with them a little bit, yeah. you can decide like, oh, if we do this again with just a little bit different numbers, same amount of people, then we wouldn't get it effect if we just played with the numbers that you targeted. So, uh, so the, there is tinkering that goes on in terms of sam. I mean, there's uh, there are modifications you can make in terms when you're trying to figure out your sample size. 
you have to decide basically what, what kind of a difference in effect size is actually going to be clinically meaningful. In fact, I could come, I could show a statistic, it's very easy to show a statistically significant result when you have a, an almost infinite number of, um, of patients enrolled in a, in a study. When your N is very high, there's, it's very easy to show a, a difference between two different distributions, but you have to um, decide what's going to be clinically, a clinically significant difference. But you can play around with your alpha to increase or decrease the power of your study. Um, but that's what the tinkering, I guess, that goes on is um, modifying that. Rich, anything you want to say? Yeah, well, I, I think the, so one of the games that drug companies, as I know very well pleasure, is have very, very large sample sizes in both groups. So because of this kind of statistics, this frequency statistics, p-values, you almost always find a statistical significance between the two groups if you have a big enough sample size. But the effect size, what the difference is, the mean between the two groups, can be very small, but statistically significant. Like if you use uh, two, uh, uh, the cancer studies are famous for this. So you give uh, two groups of patients, 10,000 in each group, and uh, patients live uh, three weeks longer in one group than the other group. Statistically significant, but then you have to decide as a 